Your ears do not deceive you. You have just entered the Cryptid Creator Corner brought to you by your friends at Comic Book Yeti. So without further ado, let's get on to the interview. Skirt of Gamut sound like something spoken by a Cthulhu cultist or the name of a weird craft beer brand, but it's actually the shorthand for this new wild crowdfunding comics project, Super Kaiju Rock and Roll Derby Fun Time Go from creator David Hedgecock. This is a mashup of Jim and the Holograms meets Roller Derby with Kaiju with a twist of 70s pop culture thrown in. Harmony, Lyra, Melody, Cadence, and Viola are a struggling 20-something band and a roller derby team flush with talent but broke as a joke. The burnouts are thrilling concert goers with their killer looks and vibe until a music mishap drops a curious ancient artifact into their hands. Cheeky, lighthearted, and fun. It will be launching soon, and there's an early bird special if you catch it in time that scores you a discount and a VIP wristband. I'll drop the link in the show notes. I read the advance for this, and honestly, it reminds me of my own carefree days gigging on the road in the music industry, but with way better shower scenes. The only thing missing is more cowbell. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Cryptic Creator Corner. I'm Byron O'Neill, your host for today's Comics Creator Chat. And this was kind of the most happenstance pathway to setting up an interview I do believe I've ever had, you know. My guest, Jonathan Marks Baravecchia, is the artist working on an exciting new image comic series, Bear Pirate Viking King, Queen, Queen, sorry about that, with writer Sean Lewis. Um, so kind of the story here is I saw a variant cover in the hardcover uh, for Last Ronin. Um, on my read through, it caught my eye. Um, it's Michelangelo kneeling with his head bowed, holding a sword in a fall forest scene with like a big food dog statue. And for some reason, it popped in my head that I should go back and see who this artist was and if they had a print of it available. Um, I think it was moving around my trade paperback shelf where I have like food dog bookends. And I think that triggered it. But anyway, I find my way to Jonathan's website. And sure enough, there's a print, but there's more to the image than is printed in the last Ronin book. There's a baby food dog. So I like I knew I had to have it. So I ordered a print when, and I was poking around to see what other stuff this incredibly talented person was doing. Turns out he had an image comics project soon to be released, and I knew I wanted to talk to him about it. So here we are. Jonathan, welcome to the show. How's things? Oh, yeah. Thanks so much for having me. It's good. Everything's good. Thanks, Brian. Yeah. So I promised Jonathan a surprise. He has he has no idea where this is going, by the way. <laughs> so so hopefully this won't completely tank. But maybe you can help me solve a dilemma. So I was, I was poking around your website, and I came across a tribute piece from the classic Frank Miller Wolverine cover, where mm. he's like, covered up fighting a bunch of ninjas does this piece mm. ring a bell it does i know yeah i know what you're talking about okay so, okay so tell me about it what what inspired you to to do that piece or so that that's actually that's a piece for uh so we were talking before we recorded i'm i'm in new york and there's a gallery i work with in chelsea called the philippe le bon gallery it specializes in narrative art comic book and illustrator from europe and, and the u.s mostly yeah uh, and so that was a piece i did for a show at philippe's it was uh, a group show with a lot of the artists he represents. And it was one of, I think I did two pieces or one or two pieces. Um, and that was, that was my, my Frank Miller tribute. I love the, the image, like it's one of the, one of the earlier comic books that I have, or one of the earlier trades that I have is that Frank Miller covered in ninjas Wolverine. Uh, and so I wanted to just sort of pay homage and, and uh, you know, show, show my interpretation of that. Very cool. Well, here here's my surprise. So yeah. the listeners will have to have to bear with me for just a moment. But okay, well, so what I'm holding up? What? Right, right, right. So I'm trying to get it. Out. Yeah. So you you can see it, but what I'm showing off is a 24 by 36 original poster from 1987 That's that hung on amazing. my wall as a kid. Yeah. So it's it's the same cover. Um, yeah. Bit of a back a backstory here. So. We we recently moved uh, close to my parents and and they've been cleaning out the attic and you know bringing us out, stuff over from Tennessee to North Carolina when they visit, which includes all of my old comics and, and posters from the area when I worked in three different comic book shops, and there are way too many of them for me to hang and my wife wants it contained to one room, right. so I got to be choosy. <laughs> so I took a bunch of them over to Acme Comics in Greensboro. Told my friend Jermaine, who is also known as Lord Retail, that I didn't want money for them. I just wanted to find them good homes. So, you know, short story long here. Uh, some of them I've already given to comics creators, I know. But this one I've held on to until it seemed like fate would intervene. So if you're interested, it's yours. 
I would love it. Thank you so much. That's amazing. Yeah, hundred percent. Oh you, hell Howard. yeah! Oh man, my yeah. wife is going to be thrilled. Uh, I doubt that. <laughs> no, I'm but, kidding. That's yeah. so cool. Thank you so much. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah, yeah, problem. Well, first off, get it getting to the actual book we're, we're <laughs> trying to cover here. I loved it. Um, I was sharing on the Comic Book Yeti Editors Discord yesterday that your work here is is absolutely the the best visual presentation I've seen in the medium in 2024. And I have no idea how you haven't been working on more major projects at this point. So I want to start with your kind of comics journey as an artist. So how did all this start? Uh, so the very start, like the very beginning was short, short or long story short, uh, you know, grew up reading comics and love comics when I was in high school, had an opportunity to, to make a comic, uh, for my senior, basically senior project, my, my high school, you know, for the last couple of weeks had this option, uh, we could, you know, get an internship, do a project with a, in the field that you wanted to study or something like that. So I, I pitched a comic book. Basically it was hard. I was 17 or 18 and it was so much harder than I thought it was going to be. I finished the, uh, I teamed up with a writer. Uh, one of the teachers was a comic book fan. He'd r- written this fantasy story back in the day. So we, we made it into like a, I don't know, 12 page comic. And it was so difficult and so discouraging that I finished the project. It's terrible. My mom has a bunch of them. It's, it's uh, just like swipes from Joe Mad and Andy and Adam Kubert and like whoever I was reading. Yeah. Um, and, and I basically like after that, I was like, okay, I can't, like, I can't do this. This is too hard. I don't want to lose the love I have for art. I don't want to lose the love I have for comic books. I can't do this as a career. So I stepped away from it for uh, not honestly, not that long. Uh, I, I studied literature and, and history in college and, you know, kind of started reading comics again and started falling in love with them again and always kept a sketchbook. And eventually, as, as I got a little bit older, still in college, I re- realized that uh need to make art of some some form or another visual art. Um, so kind of just dabbled in a bunch of different things and, and eventually recognize that i needed to focus on for me personally at least focus on one sort of discipline uh and then from from that maybe move move forward or or branch out to do you know this is this was i was still young i was like oh, i want to like design sneakers and i want to tattoo and i want to draw comics and i want to work in galleries and i want to blah blah blah, blah you know yep. and and you can't well i can't do all of those things do one thing well enough that you know other doors open um, so basically like fast forward, uh, I don't know how many years committed to comic books, um, made my, uh, you know, my submission packet and, uh, was, you know, convinced that like, well, whoever I send it to is definitely going to give me work. And so like, who should I send it to first? And obviously sent it to everybody and nobody gave me work because it was terrible. So, you know, you just, you start doing cons and, and working, you know, improving this is what I always tell young artists for, for me at least was uh you know go to the cons speak to the editors and the artists that you admire show them your work get the critiques and then find them again in six months or in a year show them the work again and again and again yeah. so eventually i uh i i was i did that for a number of years i started working with the aspen comics i was living in california at the time i was living in la those dudes are out there started doing some work with aspen um and then from from aspen started doing work with marvel um, and was actually under contract with Marvel for a couple of years. I did the Dark Tower, uh, two minis in the Dark Tower universe, the, the Lady of Shadows and Bitter Medicine. And then um, some, some singles and one shots. I did some Wolverine stuff, some Doctor Strange stuff. But at that time, I was painting more and, and, and sort of exploring more multimedia stuff in, in my comic books, in my narrative storytelling. And the Marvel editorial was great. They were very honest with me, like, hey, man, this is tough to place. Like, we're, we're having a hard time finding you work. Um, and suggested edits and, and stylistic changes that I could make to be a little, uh, to make my life a little easier to, to be working in, in mainstream comics. And, and I basically said, you know, I, I do appreciate that. This is the kind of work that I want to make. So I'm going to continue down this road. Uh, and so started doing more independent books and and uh, a lot more cover work. Um, but you know, it, it's the 
the mainstream comic book market is a funny thing. Um, I, I think I grew up with both the, you know, nineties image and Joe mad, like I said, uh, you know, X-Men books that, that I genuinely loved and sort of the vertigo stuff and the Dave McKean and, and, you know, George Pratt's Wolverine and, and these painted sort of, uh, I don't want to say more artistic, but you know, paint painterly books. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, were a big influence too. So in my mind, comic books can be either, or can be anything. Yeah. Um, and it's just about finding the right stories and, and the right audience, frankly, to, uh, to, to tell those stories who or, or the right audience who, who uh, appreciates those, those kinds of stories or that kind of art. So along your journey there was, watercolor sort of always a a component of your style or i i started working in watercolor uh no is the short answer is no uh i I started working in watercolor because it seemed i always liked working in black and white and from black and white to black ink wash made sense and then ink wash to a water-based pigment you know, watercolor made sense. Um, so I don't know. It was just sort of a progression, you know, one thing after another. I mean, like I said, I didn't study art, so I I didn't necessarily know what I was getting myself into. Sure. Um, except for, you know, high school art classes and stuff. But uh no, I I, I don't know. I, I like sort of the 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 flow, like the literal flow of the medium. So it it I always uh I always enjoyed working with it, but I don't know what what sparked it. Well, let's kind of dive directly into Bear Pirate Viking Queen. Uh, my take on this is it's all about, you know, man's conquest drive. Mm-hmm. So how did how did you get involved with the project with Sean? Uh, so Sean, there's a funny story. Sean and I are neighbors. Oh, okay. uh, we did. We, we didn't know any of this. So we, uh, I guess it was last year. Sean was doing a book at Image called uh, Above Snakes. It was a cowboy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, sort of surrealist Western. Uh, and I picked it up on a shelf and, you know, I was, oh, this is cool. I did a little sketch cover and I posted on in Instagram and, you know, I tagged him in it or I tagged him in it or I messaged him or he messaged me or something, whatever. We started talking on Instagram to do something together. Yeah. And blah, 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 blah. Uh, and one was like, or, or I asked him, I said, yo, are you in New York? I like, I live in New York. Uh, do you, I, I, I said this before. I'm, I'm, I'm like, there's a 50% chance that he lives in New York and a 50% chance he lives anywhere else in the world. So like, yeah, you know, what? he's like, I do live in New York, but, uh, you know, I don't live in the city. We, we live like upstate, like about an hour. And my wife and I had just moved out of Brooklyn, like as, as I was messaging Sean, so, oh, wow. no way. Like I, I, uh, just moved out of the city too. We live up in the Hudson Valley. He's like, I live in the Hudson Valley. So I live in this town called Beacon. I was like, no way. We just moved to this town called Beacon. He's like, oh, not really. Like I, I actually, I live in a, a small town next to Beacon that no one's heard of. And I said, I live in that city named the town. I said, I live in that same small town. So basically we're like, He's he's walked to my house before. He, we live like a mile away from each other. That is so it, wild. It's crazy. So at that point, it was really like, well, let's just meet up and like see if we even get along, and then like yeah, sure. if we can have like a working relationship, then uh, even better. So um, yeah, you know, met up for for drinks and and we're just sort of shooting shooting the shit, like talking comics, talking life, um, and eventually like talking about the kind of books that we would want to make. And it really was like just listing. I mean, I had a sketchbook with me that he was flipping through. And he's like, oh, I like this or this. Or like, what do you like to draw? And Sean's great. He's uh, not uniquely, but but a, uh, the best writers, I think, within the comic book space or within collaborative spaces are, are willing to have that conversation with the artist or with their collaborator. Like, what do you want? What do you like to draw? What do you get excited about? And that was Shawnee was, you know, what do you want to work on? Because He's like, we can figure out a story about anything. And man, it was just like literally listing nonsense, just listing things like, uh, you know, dinosaurs, pirates. Uh, I like, uh, you know, I always like drawn animals, um, samurai, uh, you know, really grounded, like detective noir. Like, I mean, I'm just literally now I'm just like, it, it was just that listing a bunch of stuff. And I think eventually we got to a list of, bear pirate viking queen and jokingly we're like ah that's a book like imagine if we just called it that 
And I think we both sort of like the light bulb went off like, yeah, imagine like what, what would that even be? So um, Sean really just sort of went off. His own. So we, we sort of decided like, let's see what that actually is. Sean went off on his own uh, for you know a week or two and uh, figured out sort of the bones of a story and, and basically brought me a, a poem and was like, I think this is something here. And it was, it was certainly not like a comic book script in the traditional sense. It was sort of a poem meets outline meets, uh, I, I don't even know what, but like, these are, these are the beats. I think this is what we want to, uh, the story we want to tell is somewhere in here. Yeah. Like, yeah, this is great, man. Uh, that that initial document, which was like two or three pages, was I was like, I think this is this alone is like a fifty page comic. So like meet up again and break it down and what happens here and here and here. So uh, like thematically, you're absolutely right. Like it turned into sort of uh, uh, an, an exploration of like uh, uh, empire and conquest and uh, you know man's sort of desire. For desires for for control and for power and what that brings but that's like the lofty bullshit like the other stuff is like right. man it's about a pirate and it's a viking it's action story it's on the water it's got a bear in it like it's just fun stuff so well for those who haven't seen your work yet um i want people to picture kind of a a mixture and i hate doing this but we got it we got to give landmarks right yeah yeah yeah. you know kind of a mixture between you know jason sean alexander and bill sinkevich like sure. somewhere in there um i think you know sinkevich especially you if you draw a parallel between enjoying drawing bears um this is something okay, he's yeah. known for I, uh, yeah it, it is it's a very visceral presentation kind of mm-hmm. which fits this the tone of this this dark tale perfectly like fluctuating between portrait realism and embracing those abstraction watercolor bleeds, you know, which provide at least a a scaffolding for some of this like bare pencil work that you're doing. Um, And and I'm educating myself on kind of how to write comics now. I'm Mm. just trying to do scripting. So, and I I come from more of an artistic background, which feels very difficult mentally to make that leap because I want to construct the visuals all the time in my head. Right. But I don't want to be that guy handing over an overly nuanced or, you know, detailed script, which just basically tells the artist what to do. Right. So it sounds like Sean, from the jump, you were very, very involved in in this collaborative process and you guys created this much more together than something where, you know, the artist is, let's say from South America, right? Like you guys are just down the road. So, yeah. And that was like invaluable. I mean, yeah, it it was definitely a, a collaboration and, and us breaking the story together. And, and like, to your point too, you know, at no point was I given very strict guidelines or, or, uh, I mean, even specifics, it makes, I I don't know. It makes my life as, as the artist harder, but it was something that I wanted and embraced. And, and frankly, for Sean, as the writer, like it takes a tremendous amount of trust for him to be like, this is, the idea of like, hey, these next three pages, let's have the pirates, you know, sail into the sunset and then, you know, uh, crash into an island. And then leave it up to me to figure out exactly how to how to do that is is take some trust. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. But what part of the script was kind of hardest for you to conceptualize or did did you just have kind of free reign to, OK, I want to take it like this? Uh Yes and no. There were some parts where, especially at the beginning, where we had sort of a, a very broad outline of where we wanted to go. And and this is entirely on me. I I got ahead of myself once or twice with like, this is going to happen and this is going to happen, blah, 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 blah. So, so I'm going to take the story in a certain direction visually mm-hmm. that that when we then met up again, Sean and I didn't make sense. And so some of those pages are just scrapped pages. Like sure. it's not, it sounds dramatic. It's not, it's not a big deal, but uh, yeah, you know, once or twice it was like, well, this, you know, you, you wanted Jonathan, you wanted to, 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 I don't want to give anything away. Let's say like even something as simple as like, 
these you you have a page here where the protagonist uh uh scared of something mm-hmm. and really for the story to hit better he needs to be uh like aggressive towards that something so you know that's just again me taking it on myself to be like oh, i want to do this thing but it doesn't fit the story and so then we like go back and make sure that we're both on the same page but but uh but again like working in that kind of collaborative space was i was never i never felt like um uh anything was being forced or or uh like i was i was having to figure anything out that that i frankly that i didn't want to figure out on my own anyway all right let's take a quick break what in the sam hill is happening right now what is that yeah, what is that? you like bards yeah what is that? oh you like band of bards it's not my fault you mumble that makes sense they're dropping some great new series right now there's that one about a heavy metal guitarist in the 1970s with monsters working class wizards you know how we love monsters around here and my friend dakota brown he's working on a project uh grandma tilly's hell tech mech with lane lloyd i saw the preview for that that is crazy Jimmy even contributed to their anthology from the static and had Matt Sumo on the podcast to talk about his project, The Bardic Verses, which makes a lot of sense that the project landed there. Where can you find them? You need to get out more. They are in previews or you can visit their website, bandabards.com, for all the latest. Can we turn the music off now? Thank you. No more surprises, minstrels, or anything like that, or I'll rent you out to the Ren Fair as a children's ride. <laughs> Let's get back to the show. There are a few moments in here which feel contemplative, like in the in the mm. first issue. Um, so there's like a panel with lightning, two full consecutive pages of stormy seas with a sky and very little else. You know, my personal mm-hmm. favorite panel with a shark that's rendered in blue. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, or it looks like kind of an homage to the famous great wave of Kanagawa, like the Japanese mm. woodblock print. Nice, thank None you. of these are particularly detailed, and they're like these primal pause buttons that let the story breathe a little bit yes. between kind of the furious action sequences. So I'm, I'm, I'm really wanted to kind of dive into process is something I yeah. love talking to artists about. So how did you put together your layouts? Because there's that dichotomy, especially between those high detailed action sequences and these very visually fluid moments that mm. aren't as detailed. Thank you. Uh, yeah. I mean, again, like because the script was so sparse was, was so unlike a script that pacing was entirely up to me. Okay. And because it was an image book or is an image book and we don't have like the page limitations that other publishers do, we can make the book as long or short as we want. So having that sort of breathing space was very important to me. And so it was, it just, I laid everything out pretty much in, in one or not one go, but like all, all together. Like, so I had the thumbnails for the first issue. I mean, you've read it, it's like 70 pages. Yeah. So I had, I had almost all those, except for the ones where I got too far ahead of myself that I, you know, pulled back. Uh, I have all, almost all those together. So I know that like, to your point, if we have a, a big action sequence, I want to slow the reader down. This is one of the greatest things about comic books that the the creative team is not in charge of, but but can influence the pace with which you consume the story. Mm-hmm. And you can do that through like a million different ways. But like for me as the visual storyteller, like slowing slowing you you down, like you said, like now is just a page, a two page spread of clouds, which. Some people might just like, oh, there's nothing to read here and flip through it. And some people might like sit in it for a moment. That's entirely up to the reader. But my intention is for you to like pause and like be in that storm with the character for those two pages or three pages or whatever it is. So again, I mean, I was very lucky that the, uh, you know, that the working relationship between Sean and I allowed for that. Yeah. I mean, what really blew me away more than anything else was the panel diversity Mm. because it's bold. Uh, you. you are you are definitely playing with shapes. I mean, more than even it's very in style, you know, with the big two, like I'm thinking Batman or something like yeah. that, where they get really pretty creative with layouts. But but this you're you're doing all all kinds of crazy stuff. So talk to me about how you're wanting to to take a reader 
you know, from point A to point B and how you're doing layouts and how you, mm-hmm. you know, set this up on the page? Um, I, I don't know. I mean, at this point, it's almost intuitive. I have a lot of influences from within comic books from, you know, um, American and European and Japanese artists. Mm-hmm. So I think that that's influenced some of my storytelling, uh, like, like architecture in, in, in moving the eye around the page. Like I said, I mean, I, I did grow up with some of those image books where it was the, like that big anchor panel or that big, you know, figure and then breaking the borders and then doing all this nonsense. So that's in there somewhere. Uh, but, but I think that I want to only use those tricks when it's absolutely necessary and, and when it's in service to like, like moving around the page. Okay. And, and frankly too, I, like, honestly, I, I, uh, I heard, uh, I think Brian Boland in an interview was talking about this too, where like our job as, as illustrators or as, as specifically as comic book illustrators is to tell the story and the art itself is kind of a secondary thing. But for me, and, and Brian was saying this too, Brian, Mr. Boland was saying this, uh, uh, it was like, we, 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 we love the art. Like it's very important to me and to my fragile little ego that like this bear looks cool as shit. So I want as that panel, that panel has to look perfect. Yeah. And then because it's a comic book, not only that, but it has to pull you into that next panel, which also has to look perfect, which has to pull you across into, you know, so yeah. it's like a, a juggling act. I don't know if that answers your question or not, but no, it, it does. Cause I'm just always interested in getting into the mind of how, how people conceptualize us because I'm coming from, uh, like a fine art photography background. Mm, yeah. So I don't tell, I mean, you do in terms of a, a series of images that you're putting yeah. together in terms of sequential, they need to have a, a thematic thread, you know, that combines them all, but not, not like this. Right. Right. Um, so I'm just interested in, in how, how people, you know, put that stuff together yeah. and, and you're getting away with so much. There was like one full page scene on the, with a, a boat, where it's almost entirely black. The masthead bisects the page. Yeah, right? yeah. Which, which definitely breaks with like these traditional composition rules, but but it worked, right? You pulled it off. So it's it moments like that that I was yeah, just thanks. like, damn, man, he he's really pushing the envelope here. Oh, so. good. Thank you. I'm glad that, that some of them work. <laughs> that that one that really jumped out to me. I was oh, like, yeah, wow, wow. Okay, so I'm trying to do this. No, nope, there's information on the other side. I'm, get, I'm getting it. I'm getting it. It doesn't bother me at all that there's just black, good oh, yeah. it. well it's almost like a panel break anyway yeah 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 yeah, yeah. I, I mean it, it's you you talk about photography i mean like the composition of the image of the single image especially on like a splash or a, or a double page spread is super important to me it's definitely something that i'm thinking about and and as much as i love traditional comic book art i do want to uh sound like an asshole like challenge what that can be sometimes no you got to you know i mean that that's what pushes you yeah, exactly. And and again, my influences, like you said, Sinkevich is definitely one. Jason's another one. But you know, Dave McKean and George Pratt and Kent Williams, you know, Muth, like these were ah, these were the big ones. my language. Yeah. yeah Muth, these were Muth, the big yeah. ones who who were like, oh, okay, we can do this, this whole thing as well. It was very yeah. cool, very like uh eye opening for me. Yeah, Muth is so underrated, like one of yeah. my, my favorites yeah, yeah, yeah. and, and just didn't do enough stuff, but no, I know he's got kids' books now that I'm always trying to scoop up. Uh, I can't remember the latest one. It's like an uh, uh, an astronaut something. It's cool. It's like a little bit more kid friendly, but beautiful still. Oh. Well, whoever the editor is on the book, God bless him for leaving in the that like white negative space that that you're utilizing because that has that's a heavenly visual right there. Right? No editors. We were doing it. It's just Sean and I. Really so glad. So thank you. I'm, I'm glad that it works. Yeah. Okay, I hope editors see this it sells really well, and and yes. that more people do this because it's so good to use Thank the you. space like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, you have these distinct linear archetype phases as well to deal with. You know, kind of the bear operates off of instinct. The the pirate is beholden to no code other than freedom. You know, the Viking is savage but existing in a more rigid societal and religious structure. And the queen, which I don't quite know yet, but I'm imagining representing kind of that ruthlessness, but you know, nonetheless, a civilized character. Mm-hmm. So how did you go about kind of wanting to portray each? Because they're, they almost function like phases, if you. Mm-hmm. 
because there's there's not a I guess a I don't want to give too much away, but mm. there, there's not a singular distinct protagonist. Let's put it that way. Yes. <laughs> Um, I also don't want to give too much away as, uh, as the series, as the mini series goes forward. Sure. Um, so yes, to everything that you said, okay. uh, uh, we also, I'll say this, which will kind of answer the question. It's, it's a three issue mini and we wanted each issue to sort of stand alone as well as contribute to a larger narrative and within each issue to sort of examine those archetypes like you're absolutely right uh that that we uh were sort of playing into uh to examine them as archetypes and then to examine like what that means and how we can sort of challenge that mm -hmm. so yeah i mean you've read the first issue you know yeah. how the first issue ends mm -hmm. the second issue picks up right after that but fills uh follows a different path sure uh and then the third issue you know uh, uh, again uh sort of take takes the the the, the reader hopefully in, in in a surprising and enjoyable direction sean and i wanted as as longtime fans of comics wanted to make sure that at no point or or in in as few times as we can that the story was predictable that that now this this next thing is going to happen that you know the 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 disenfranchised english sailor is going to turn into a pirate and then we see that happen and then the pirate you know challenges the king pirate and then he wins and then that happens and then you know it's predictable it's fun but we wanted to sort of challenge that both in the the characters themselves and then in the storytelling okay so. well maybe we can get into the form language then right so mm. you've got you've got those four you also have the pirates. Um, I know a fair number of comic artists use pictures as guides. So do you mm. use reference photos at all? Or you know, I do. You... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I shoot. I shoot all my reference, uh, and then you know, find stuff on online. You know, reference for, for old ships and and fashion and uh, okay, you know, uh, whatever it's called. You know, like the weaponry and the sh it's not, I'll be honest, it's not exhaustively researched. If you are a scholar of 17th century, or I guess it would be 16th century, uh, like weaponry, it's probably not accurate. But like, yeah, this looks cool and it's old, and, you know, right? whatever. Yeah. Uh, but, but I do use a lot of photography. I do shoot uh, most of, mostly myself, frankly. Uh, and, you know, my camera and my phone have just a bunch of pictures of me looking growling like a pirate or you know standing like a viking or you know whatever or occasionally my wife if i can bully her into it or friends but uh yeah i i like when i was younger i i didn't um i was embarrassed to admit that i used reference i felt like especially as a comic book artist like i need to be able to like come off the dome man like what does spider-man look like when he's swinging between two buildings upside down and flipping back and forth like i need to know anatomy so well that i can do that quick off the top of my head and you should honestly like especially if you're doing superheroes or especially if you're doing spider-man you have to know anatomy back to front but i found with the kind of work that i do too i like having the reference in front of me so that i can pick and choose what i use from it so i can yeah. spend less time sketching my my layouts you know once i figured out the thumbnails for the for the full page my pencils are really I mean, I use a little red pencil and it's really just kind of, you know, an egg for the head and then the the stick figure body with notes for the elbows or for the hands or for the feet or whatever it is. And then I go straight into it with ink and I can do that because I have the reference to one side of me. So I, I have something to like visualize and then I can go into the ink and, and sort of just immediate, I like have that immediacy of the line when I pull it instead of trying to sketch and sketch and find the right line and find the shift here or there just just go right into it and i think it just makes for a more interesting and honest uh look it certainly does um and I'm, I'm very glad i'm a photographer too because like that mm. i can't imagine doing it that way especially if i'm putting down you know ink washes and stuff on hey to be scared i'd fuck everything up all the time and yeah yeah 
There's, I mean, there's, I've got a, I'm actually, I'm working on the, a new cover, the cover for the trade right now on my desk. And it's got so far only one patch. So I do everything traditionally. And there's one like chunk that's just a different piece of paper that's glued on top of the board where I fucked it up already. So yeah. Eh, eh, yeah. It's, yeah. So you're lettering the project as well. So is this your first time yes. lettering as well? It is. Yeah. 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 Figured it out for this, like taught myself and, you know, did a couple little projects with friends to make sure that I was confident and comfortable with it. But uh, the lettering is all digital. So that, that does give me a little bit of uh, wiggle room. The, the, a lot of the, sorry, fix my light. Um, uh, a lot of the sound effects are, are on the boards, but all the, the dialogue is, is digitally done in uh, Procreate. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. I was yeah. thinking that some of those fonts were hand drawn. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. All the fonts are hand drawn. Uh, okay. so I, I designed the, the fonts themselves. Yeah. Uh, but then I can do, I can letter the whole thing digitally. Okay. Well, kind of, what kind of projects are you most interested in? Let's say next, right? Like what, what is enamoring you lately? There's a couple projects that I'm working on now that I'm very excited for that I can't talk about. Uh, I'm used to that. But I like, yeah, I know it sounds, I, I was at a con a couple of years ago where I was saying that to someone and they were like, oh, that just means you're not working on anything. God damn it, man. That's so no, rude. no, no, no. It means but, these things take years. But it's, to get it's out. unfortunately, yeah, you know, like Sean and I have another project that, that we've got in with some editors, you know, as a, as a pitch document now. Uh, I've, I've spoken with some other writers where I've got some, some pages in the works. I do, uh, book illustration as well. I've got, um, uh, an illustrated edition of uh, Mind Swap, and I can't remember the name of the author that's coming out this year. Um, ah, anyway, um, but in the comic book space, yeah, I mean, I love doing this kind of thing. I love doing sort of the fantasy, surreal stuff. I like the adventure. I like, uh, uh, honestly, after this book being so sort of free and broad uh i i like the idea of of sort of doing something smaller for the okay, next sure. book which is one of yep. the one of the projects that actually sean and i are talking about okay. is uh you know super grounded like a, a detective story something that's that's smaller in scope small uh, uh limited in uh visuals as much as i love to like bear pirate is sort of me showing off or trying to show off it's unrestrained, yeah. It's uh, yeah, yeah. Unrestrained is a yes. Yeah. Uh, I I think that I actually look forward to uh, one of the projects that's in the works that's like super grounded. Like I can't I can't hide behind. Well, this is a big like expressive watercolor wash. It's like no, it's just like black and white. Like the shadow is right or it's wrong. Yep. Because you can always throw down more watercolor. I mean, you can. It doesn't always work. Nah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the thing. Yeah, you can always add more. Well, I'm going to get in the weeds about paper for just a sec because I'm always mm -hmm. interested in you know paper choices for watercolor artists, and I've experimented with quite a few different papers in my own work like that. You know, like 100% mm -hmm. rag, 50/50 rag pulp, mm -hmm. even mulberry. So, mm -hmm. you know, what do you like to use? What do you typically use? I started with the. I've got an Arches roll of uh, a hot press. It's 153 pound, okay. which only comes in these giant rolls they don't do yeah. it in in books uh so i do like that it's a little bit pricey to be honest so i've i've experienced there's a a whole bind multimedia paper that i like and then um i've actually really enjoying stonehenge paper which okay. takes a wash pretty well um and then i've also got some strathmore bristol and some like I'm trying to see it on my files over there um uh I think it's a Canson, just a drawing pad that's not particularly good paper, but like the way I like the way that the watercolor or that the pigment sits on it, it kind of pools on it. Mm -hmm. so you have to wait. The same with the Bristol, like you have you have to wait longer than with uh with a water with a traditional watercolor paper. Yeah. Because the pigment isn't absorbed as quickly. Um, but it, it has like a cool and interesting look to me. Okay. So does it does it typically make a more saturated color that way then? 
um, since it's pooling and it just takes longer to soak or it can do it. I find it, it, uh, traditional watercolorists would hate it because you get those halos a lot easier. Gotcha. You will have, because the, the, the pigment will be dispersed basically around a bubble of a bubble of, of water. Mm-hmm. So you'll have the lightest area in the middle of your wash. And then surrounding it, you kind of have a, a darker area, and it gets lighter as it goes to the middle, which yeah. you can which you can easily paint around or move that that you know heavier area of water, or be more precise when you're putting the water down or wet the paper before. There's a million things you can do, right? Uh, but I I like that look. Uh, sometimes I want that very smooth wash. Sometimes I like the uh, almost like segmented pieces of of color uh almost like i i i like painting in oils as well and i remember one like as an adult i've been trying to take painting classes with artists who i like who i know and uh one one of the artists who i love uh described uh painting with oils as, as putting down pieces of paint uh and and i think watercolor doesn't typically work that way but uh, with with some of these papers, like where it does pull, you can kind of put down a little piece and then wait, let it let it soak in or move or do whatever it wants. Put something else down. Put something else down. Wow! It's all about patience, which I sometimes have and sometimes do not. I I'm still blown away that you can manage to do this on a singular piece of paper. Because I was I was talking yeah. to Tyler Crook about this with the the Lonesome Hunters, and he was breaking mm-hmm. down how how he goes about doing it, and it's much more panel by panel you know yeah. and then then he's drafting things on on the page kind of jigging things in but okay th- this explains why the reads work the way they do in this because it's just i don't know to try to describe it to somebody listening it's just so much more fluid mm. than you typically expect from from most comic books you know yeah thank you um yeah yeah i, I mean I, I love the hell out of it so um where can everybody find you online uh, so i'm on instagram at jonathan marks art and I have a website on uh, online. Uh, it's just jonathanmarksart.com. That's, that's it. Just the two. Cool. We'll put them in the show notes. I think it should be clear uh, to everybody that I like the book quite a bit. Um, so listeners should get uh, the pre-orders in because I selfishly want to see Jonathan get more work. But also because, because this thing is kind of a visual feast. I mean, it really is. It's one of those things where you really got to take time to read it. Um, so I really appreciated the pacing and, and really trying to slow people down because everybody, even comics journalist friends, my co-host Jimmy, we're all trying to to slow down the, mm. the reading process because it's just that tendency is to spend seven, eight seconds, especially on a splash page and you're done. Um, so don't do that here at all because there's, yeah, there's, yeah. there's so much to, to, to pull in and for your eyes to kind of feast on. Um, it is poetic carnage. That is how I'm christening it. Um, oh yeah, I like that. If if people are fans of like Game of Thrones or or Black Sails, this is the book for you. So, Bear Pirate Viking Queen is in stores when exactly? Uh, first issue is out May first. The uh, FOC, the the final order cutoff for your shops is April eighth. Okay. Uh, so do tell your shops, uh, support your local shops. Tell them to order it for you. Get it in your pull box before the eighth of April. Well, Jonathan, thanks so much for joining me on the show today and kind of indulging in my my deeper artistic. Of course, yeah, that was fun. Good. I good. love talking but, about this stuff. Good. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Well, this is Byron O'Neill, and on behalf of all of us at Comic Book Yeti, thanks for tuning in, and we will see you next time. Take care, everybody. This is Byron O'Neill, one of your hosts of the Cryptid Creator Corner, brought to you by Comic Book Yeti. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of our podcast. Please rate, review, subscribe, all that good stuff. It lets us know how we're doing, and more importantly, how we can improve. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode of the Cryptid Creator Corner, maybe you would enjoy our sister podcast, Into the Comics Cave. Listen and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts.